Good evening to everybody. Welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator for Gibson's Bookstore, and I am joined this evening by author Larry Olmstead, who has a new book out this season called Fans, How Watching Sports Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Understanding. He is joined in conversation by his friend, Jeff Bradley, who has been one of Larry Olmstead's friends since 1989, when 1983, when they and fellow doormates cheered on their Georgetown Hoyas men's basketball team to the national championship. So these gentlemen are going to talk about sports. Uh, I'm a book person, so I'm very interested in the sports ball conversation. Uh, now, the, this book is available from Gibson's Bookstore. We are open for in-store browsing, curbside pickup, and we do ship very happily. If you would like to ask a question this evening of the authors or you have interesting conversation to include, there is a chat sidebar. I do encourage you to drop your questions into there or the Q&A function. There is a separate box. We will be answering questions later in the event. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Great. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, Gibson's Bookstore. And thank you, Larry, for inviting me to have this conversation with you tonight. You know, you and I have talked on and off sports for almost 40 years now. Um, and uh, I'm curious, though, I, I've read your other two books. Uh, I, I never will buy cheap olive oil again. But I'm curious in the case of this book, which is kind of a departure from the travel food guy, which is I know your handle, um, this book about sports and about about fandom, so called. So I'm curious about what sparked this one. What were the itches that you had to scratch that uh, that produced this uh, this great new book? Well, um, whether it's my books or my articles, and I've written thousands of magazine and newspaper articles, I'm always looking for a story that hides in plain sight. You know, I love a topic that everyone knows about, but people don't know about. And that's been the theme of all my books, even though they're completely different. That's sort of the, the unifying thread is, it's something that you say, oh yeah, I know about food, or I know about the Guinness Book of World Records, or I know about sports, but then look at it in a way that's different than you might normally do. And in this case, um, I wasn't looking to do a sports book or a fan book. I wasn't quite up to my next book project in any case. But I went to a Red Sox game at uh, Fenway, and I saw this couple who uh, had dressed their young children in very young children in T-shirts with obscenities on them directed at the New York Yankees. And uh, it disturbed me. <laughs> and I left the game thinking, like, what's wrong with these people? And I thought about it afterwards. And I thought, you know, maybe is there something about sports that makes us crazy, makes us bad people? And if there is, that might be an interesting book. So I started to do the research. And as soon as I dove into the data, I saw that that was completely wrong, uh, that sports fandom is overwhelmingly beneficial to us. And it then occurred to me that there were you know, 45,000 people that day at the stadium who I didn't notice. I only noticed these two because they're the outliers. The other 45,000 are normal, happy, well-adjusted sports fans. Right, right. Not putting obscenities on their kids' uh, <laughs> shirts. So, um, so fans, like as a general term, is a is a is a pretty big title. I know. I mean, my, my two kids are Harry Potter fans, and mm -hmm. I'm a fan of asparagus, and you know, I know some other fans of French poodles or whatever. That's not the kind of fan, like generically, you're talking about, though. It's a particular sports fan, and which, and when I hear that, I think the Bears, <laughs> but which we've talked about, but I, but I know that's not just what you're talking about here either. It's a bigger picture than just that kind of image that we might have of a sports fan, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's two parts to that. One, the, 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 the second being the bears, you know, I took a kind of deep dive into uh, the way fans have been portrayed in entertainment. And I looked at basically every TV show, every movie that features fans and the stereotype is overwhelmingly negative. Uh, at the best, it's the sort of lovable drunk fat guy. And at the worst, it's a psychotic killer. Um, but that is not what real sports fans are like. And that stereotype is, is not accurate. Uh, but it is similar in ways to a lot of other kind of fandom, not asparagus and not poodles. But um, I consider it a, a form, sports a form of entertainment. So in a lot of ways, 
fandom of sports is similar to fandom of Harry Potter or music or Star Wars, but in a lot of ways, it's better for you than those kind of other, other entertainment fandoms. And it's not that there's anything wrong with being a Harry Potter fan. It's just, it doesn't work the way sports fandom works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a different level. So I, I want to get this out right away because uh, we were introduced, obviously, with a Georgetown connection. Um, and we have um, together experienced a, a pretty magical moment a long time ago. Uh, as freshmen at Georgetown when uh, the Hoyas went um, all the way. uh, And that was uh, in a time when the drinking age for beer was 18 in DC, (laughs) but that's irrelevant. Um, And so I'm kind of curious now, because the full arc of that story of following that team back then, led by a guy named Patrick Ewing, who just literally in the last week has been back on the headlines. And I'm wondering about the fandom story as it, as it relates to that um, kind of arc of some of a player that you can, that you can watch and then you can see as a, as a coach. And there's a level of kind of loyalty, obviously, that one has also to their, to their college that seems different to like the loyalty to you know, the local team that, of the town you moved to. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of depth of fandom? And I don't know if that's part of what you explore. Sure, and I would say, um... I'd love to be able to say that, you know, that freshman year was the progenitor of this book. Uh, It's not really true, but it was for me a particularly eye-opening experience because I'm I'm from New York City and New York is probably the most uncollegiate sports interested major city in the country. Um, And I, you know, grew up, you know, with multiple professional baseball, hockey, football, and basketball teams, but no real interest in anybody I knew in college sports. So I was unprepared for what it would mean to win the NCAA championship as a freshman. And it was great. It was a great experience, but it wasn't even until later that I realized, you know, there's a lot of people who are big college basketball fans who go to whatever it is, you know, UNC, Duke, um, you know wherever and don't ever see them win the championship. I mean, most, most students don't, you know, it's, you know, even if it's four different teams in four years, that's still, you know, pretty slim shot for the whole country. So, you know, it, it gave me an appreciation for that big time college athletics. And then I would say that um, I found uh, I'm asked a lot when I do sports talk radio, what, who are the most passionate fans? And I think, uh, college fans are more passionate in, in general than pro uh, fans of pro teams, especially college football. <laughs> but um, but with um, the, the big difference is sports fandom is, is very similar in a lot of ways to religion. And in both cases, you don't actually make any choices. Uh, in religion, the religion you practice is driven by two main factors, where you're born and what your parents believe. In sports, your teams that you support are driven by the same two factors, where you're born and what your parents believe. College is the big exception because college is based on where you go to college, which in many cases has nothing to do with where you're from, your background, your family's background. So it's a little bit of an outlier. And I think it's also a little bit more of an attachment at, at some level because it's the one that you actually made for yourself. Interesting. Yeah, I'm curious about the connection with uh, with religion too. And I, I know that um, not on the same Sunday, but I know that I have attended um, evangelical Christian worship on a Sunday morning. And I know on a Sunday afternoon, I've attended a Pittsburgh Steelers home game and walked through the tailgate section and been at the game. And I can say there's a connection, it seems to me, between the exuberance of the worshipers um, <laughs> in the morning and those in the afternoon on a Sunday. So did you find that in the conversations you were having with people that that thread was pretty evident in your, in your research? Yeah. I mean, I didn't meet a lot of people who were both deeply religious and deep sports fans though, you know, in my superstition section of the book, uh, there is a Notre Dame fan who says that before every football game, he has to recite three Bible verses and then chug three beers before every quarter. So, you know, there's a, there was a little crossover there. Um, but, uh, but as a social structure, 
sports fandom and religion are very similar in that, I mean, they're the two biggest social structures in the world by far. And, uh, and more people are sports fans than belong to any organized religion. And, uh, you know, I would argue that sports fandom is bigger than religion, but it's, they're, they're, they're one and two, neck and neck, uh, and they're both global. Uh, you know, every society has religion, every society has sports fans. And, and, um, and the other, but re, uh, participation in religion has been in decline. And the other major sort of social structures that bring people together in a kind of community minded way, everything from bowling leagues, which were once really big, to fraternal organizations like the Elks Club, to even workplace water cooler conversation, even before the pandemic, you know, was in decline because of technology. Mm -hmm. And all of those things are the ways people People come together with the people around them on a regular basis. And of those, only sports is sort of going strong. Interesting. That sounds to me like it's a potential for uh, lots of social benefit, too, in that regard. I mean, in, in some ways, the way that religion uh, at another level has a social benefit. Does, do sports have a social benefit and a social impact, would you say, that's beyond just that was a fun game to watch? What would you find out about that? Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. Without a doubt, and and you know the title of the book, you know I believe sports makes us happier, it makes us healthier, and it makes us more understanding. And the more understanding is probably um, the part that connects to what you're asking about, because by that I mean, actually, you know the the process of being a sports fan has made us over time more tolerant, open-minded, democratic-minded people. It it's greatly assisted in the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. Uh, currently the social justice movement. So, you know, it makes us better people and the world a better place. But what really surprised me was the other ways in which sports fandom reaches into different areas of society you might not think of. And, and that's why if you're, if you're a sports fan and you pick up my book, you're going to like it. You're going to find something to like, and you're going to find something you relate to and be like, oh yeah, I remember that brings back memories. You know, it's, there's a lot of common ground, but what I would like is for, you know, non-sports fans to read it to learn how you know they too get to live in a better world because of sports fans, whether they ever watch a game or not. And some of those areas, uh, some of my favorite areas of the books, um, the post-traumatic healing power of sports after yeah, about that. You know, natural and man-made disasters. I'll come back to that one in a minute. It's um, uh, world peace, politics, nation building, re reconciliation. Um, I mean, the role, there's a reason why the UN has a big division devoted to sports and the Vatican has a sports initiative. And, um, you know, it, it, this is something that actually impacts the world around us in a way that is much bigger than people sitting on a couch, drinking beers, rooting, rooting for the bear. So, but, but yeah, the, um, the, uh, the post-traumatic healing part was the most interesting to me of all the aspects in the book. And that's because, um, you know, I knew about 9-11. I grew up in New York. I grew up in Queens. So I used to go to Mets games. That was the first sporting event I ever, you know, went to. And uh, when I was in high school, I worked in the World Trade Center. So, uh, you know, I have a, a connection to that. And after 9-11, sports in this country were completely canceled for about nine or 10 days. And the longest um, such gap before the current pandemic. And, um they, when they came back to New York, the first professional sporting event played in New York was this Mets Braves game at Shea Stadium. And it's become sort of iconic. And the Mets won on a come from behind Mike Piazza home run in the eighth inning. And I talked to fans who were there at that game and they were all deeply moved. But one of them said to me, you know, that was the moment when it was okay to smile again, to clap again, you know, to be normal again. And that's what sport often does. It brings people together in these large numbers, I mean, the state, big stadiums in our country are bigger than any churches or synagogues or mosques and um, enables them to share emotion, especially after that. But anyway, I knew about that because I was there and, you know, I remember 9-11, but I, I thought that was sort of an outlier, uh, you know, one of a kind moment. But when I did the research for this book, I discovered that it's not at all. It goes back to ancient Greece. And, um, after Pearl Harbor, after the Boston Marathon bombing, after Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Harvey, sports over and over plays this role of being a big healer. And 
in the case uh, of the one October massacre in Las Vegas, the biggest mass shooting in American history, that was 2017. And Las Vegas was at the time the largest city in the country that didn't have any teams in the big four professional sports. They had just gotten their first franchise, NHL Las Vegas Golden Knight, first game to be played nine days after this you know, horrible shooting that really ripped the city apart. And because it was recent, I got to go out there and I interviewed a lot of people, people who had been shot, people who had been shot at, uh, cab drivers, bartenders, the mayor, uh, NHL executives, you know, people all across the city in every walk of life. And one after another, they told me, you know, we could not have gotten through this without the Knights. And I spoke to a woman who was traumatized and afraid to leave her house. And friends called and said, hey, we have season tickets. Come to a Knights game. It's now. And then again, no. And then she's seen a few games. I she, She's seen it on TV. She's read about it in the paper. And finally, she's like, I got to live my life. I got to get out of here. She goes to a Knights game. Never went to a hockey game before, was a basketball fan, falls in love with it, goes to 50 more games that season and tells me about how, you know, the Knights basically saved her. And when you hear those stories over and over firsthand, then it becomes impossible to dismiss this as something frivolous or just entertainment. It's a vital part of the social fabric of our life. And it was at that moment that I sort of knew that this is a real thing. And that's the real power of it there. Yeah. So, um, Larry, you mentioned the the, the Mets, um, and uh, which brings me to a moment of of suffering, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which you'll remember from uh, a few years back against the Red Sox um, and um, and, uh, and 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 Bill Buckner. So I'm wondering, you know, teams lose a lot, so people put all this effort into you know cheering on their their favorite team, only to watch them them fail, you know. And I, <laughs> I was always intrigued how um, I remember seeing pictures of the New Orleans Saints fans wearing paper bags that say "Aints" on them yep. in the stadium, which makes me wonder why you even go to the stadium when you just stay home and wear the paper bag. But anyway, what about that suffering side of sports? Is that good for you? Would you say? And did you find that even despite all the pain that goes along with the you know the agony of defeat, that this is still worthwhile? Well, in, in most cases, no, the suffering isn't good for you, but the good news is it's not nearly as bad as you would think. Mm -hmm. And if you look at any sport, you know, football, one team wins the Super Bowl, one team wins the World Series, right? One team will win the NCAA tournament. Does that mean that, you know, all the other 63 teams and their fans are losers? Uh, no, I don't think so. And, and scientists don't think so. So the data shows that we basically have a, a sports fandom circuit breaker in our head so that when our teams win, especially big games, the upside potential for joy, happiness, whatever it brings you is, is limitless. But when they lose, it's, it's limited. You, you're, you stop suffering. And if you look at the, um, say the Super Bowl, if you are a Kansas City Chiefs fan, if you're a Tampa Bay fan, you're, you're the underdogs, you just won the first time any team has ever played at the Super Bowl on a scale of one to hundred, that's a hundred. But if you're a Chiefs fan, it's not a zero. You won, you know, the AFC, you played, had a great season. You went to the Super Bowl, you got to watch the Super Bowl and you had won the Super Bowl last year. You know, it's a 20 or a 30 or something, right? But most teams in most sports over the long term are pretty average. And if your team is 50-50, you come out ahead. Even if it's 40-60, you come out ahead because you get more from the, the wins than you lose from the losses. And then in the case of the really long suffering teams like the Cubs before they won the World Series, sure. when they're that bad that the droughts are that long, the fans get a sort of added pride in being fans because they're hardcore. There's no Johnny come lately jumping on that bandwagon. and you know, they're earning their fandom. And I, I talked to some older Cubs fans who, you know, viewed the World Series win with mixed emotions. It was something they always wanted. They were happy to have it, but it in a way lowered like the quality of their fandom because now everybody was a Cubs fan. And um, so, you know, I think the worst is if, if your team was, you know, sort of perennially 25 and 75, not bad, not bad enough to be really bad and never good. But, you know, over time it changes. And the other thing is, you know, they say time heals all wounds. And that's pretty true about even the big losses. Even 1986, if you're a Red Sox fan, you won a bunch since then. So it's easier to put that in the rearview mirror. 
But if you're a Mets fan, 1986 is the last time you won the World Series. And I remember that, that team and the players and what happened, but I don't remember anything about 1983 or 1989 or 1992 because the big wins, and again, the Cubs fans, they want to win another World Series, but if they don't, in a way, that's, that's enough. They've got the one, and they're never going to forget it. And when you talk to, um, you know, if you talk to a Jets fan who was alive in 1969 following football, they're going to remember that game, you know, but soon, soon there won't be any Jets fans who ever saw them win. You wait long enough. It, it reminds me of the, you know, the, uh, the saying or the um, tendency to say when your team wins, we won. Yeah, it looks like your video froze. And when in they lose, yeah. they lost. Yeah, and that's another coping mechanism. Yeah, we... Oh, sorry, am I back? You look a little frozen, but I, I know I know exactly what you're saying. It's uh, it's another coping mechanism that the fans distance themselves from the failure by saying they lost, but they take they revel in the wins as if you know, they had helped them saying we won and, and that's good. And one sports psychologist told me, you know, if fans hadn't, sports fans hadn't perfected coping mechanisms, there wouldn't be any sports fans. Right, right. Sorry about the little internet glitch here. The, um, I want to ask you, Larry, kind of in this Frank's fans, the notion of nation, is something from my childhood. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the kind of tribal nature of sports that, that speaks to that need to belong uh, to a tribe that distinguishes itself from another tribe, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, humans are tribal animals. It's in our nature. It's in our DNA. Since the Stone Ages, we have formed groups, you know, tribes, villages, city states, uh, communities of different kinds. And we want to be around and with other people. And when you're that you know, rare person who wants to live in the middle of the woods by yourself, well, you're either committing a thousand felonies or you're the Unabomber. Um, so uh, sports fills that function really easily because it's an easy community to get into. And it accepts everyone into the fan base, regardless of age, race, religion, income, education. Um, but beyond that, what earlier, you know, when I said that there's qualities to being a sports fan that are better than qualities of being another kind of entertainment fan, that's where this really plays out. Because when, like, I like Star Wars. But when I watch a Star Wars movie from my couch by myself, I'm alone watching a Star Wars movie. If I watch a football game on my couch, I'm not really, people think they're watching a football game or a baseball game, but what you're really watching is a stadium full of spectators and players. And those spectators, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 of them are in your view the entire time. And a lot of them are wearing their jerseys and their hats and holding up foam fingers or whatever it is. So you cannot help but feel that you're part of a crowd and sports fans who are interviewed by psychologists feel that they're at the game in many ways, even when they're watching it from their couch. So in that, that way, you're, you can be part of the community even when you're alone. And going beyond that, we get all of this reinforcement of being, and this is why when we talk about sports teams in this country, we use this word fill in the blank nation, Red Sox nation, Raiders nation, Packers nation, but you don't say Harry Potter nation about the fans uh, because the community is so layered that it's like a country into itself. And when you go to the supermarket and you're walking down the aisle and you've got your Bruins hat on and you see somebody with a Bruins t-shirt, you make a connection. An NHL executive I talked to calls this the head nod. You kind of make eye contact, you give a little bit of a, of a nod, and you have a connection. And again, doesn't matter age, you know, race, income, any of that stuff. You have a connection to a total stranger because you're both wearing Bruins or Red Sox or Patriots gear. And that could happen if you had your Metallica shirt on and you pass somebody else with a Metallica shirt on. But in our society, that just does not happen as much with anything but sports. And so it's a constant reminder. And then even goes, I've been given a lot of thought lately to bumper stickers, right? My next door neighbor has a Red Sox and a Patriots sticker on his pickup truck. 
but I've never seen like a Harry Potter bumper sticker and even bands, music entertainment. I've never seen a Beatles bumper sticker. I've seen thousands and thousands in my lifetime of sports bumper stickers. Sure, sure. So it's a way that, you know, when you're a Red Sox fan, even a license plate, right? And in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, you can get a Red Sox logo license plate. There's no other privately owned for-profit business that you can buy a logo on your license plate. And you can't get an Apple license plate, even if you really like your iPhone. Um, so, you know, this is something that, we're kind of, it's around us all the time, reinforcing this belief or feeling that we're part of something. And that's, you know, what that tribal, it satisfies that tribal urge. That's why we're happier. All of these mental health benefits, the sports psychologist, they've come up with like two different, two dozen different mental health benefits that sports fans enjoy more than non-fans from lower rates of depression to higher self-esteem to more satisfaction with their social lives. But they're all a fancy way of saying we're happier because we feel we're part of a community. That's really interesting. You know, and and you mentioned, Larry, in the, or we mentioned in the write-up about the time I spent in Italy and just an observation here that I think plays into this a little bit. So when you're a kid in Italy and our kids were four and one when we moved over there, um, you, you basically, as soon as you can walk and talk, you have to say who your team is. And in Italy, in the Serie A, kind of like the major league of soccer there, um, it doesn't matter that you cheer for a team that's far from your hometown. You, you can cheer for one of the top teams in that league. You always cheer for the local team, which is usually the lower division team anyway. And then you pick a Serie A team anywhere in the country. And it's, a, as you know, a pretty big deal in, in Italy to, to play soccer. But then what you don't see are as is, is much in Italy of the Italian country flag, the way you do say in America on people's, you know, uh, um, uh, doorways in, uh, or pickup trucks, you know, in, in yeah, just last night here in New Hampshire, I saw a guy drive by with a big American flag headed to town meeting actually. Anyway, um, every four years, the Italians bust out the blue Italian national flag during the world cup. It's the one time a year when they say, okay, I'm not against you now. We're all together. And I guess that's what, that's a sort of shifting of tribe <laughs> allegiances or something, isn't it? In that case. Yeah. And probably for the Olympics as well, yeah. um, you know, because we don't in this country have as many big international events, you know, other than the Olympics, there's like the Ryder cup, you know, but there, we don't have, uh, the equivalent of some of the of the big soccer matches and um but um you know i think there are there are definitely some differences but you know in a in a one way fans are fans all over the world in other ways you know they're different because the sports are different you know obviously soccer is the most popular i didn't know until i did this book that cricket is the second most popular spectator sport in the world um you know, you don't hear much. Nobody says like cricket's the next big thing in the way they've been saying about soccer for the last, you know, 40 years. Uh, but I will say uh, one thing that I would like to see more of in this country that I experienced in Italy, um, we were in, uh, I think T Tuscany, we were in a small town somewhere in Italy during the World Cup, like Italy, France, World Cup. And everybody opened their windows and turned the game came on the TV as loud as they could and then came down to the streets with like glasses of wine in their hands. And it was like a, like a street fair strolling community event and nobody was really watching the game, but everybody was listening to it, you know, as if it had been broadcast on a PA system. And I thought like, wow, that's a really cool way to hang out with your neighbors. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, you know, it reminds me a little bit of, although on a much smaller scale, what, a, what happens in a sports bar, and I think that was one of the things that I didn't know about until I read your book that uh, a sports bar, I mean, it's a branding mechanism, I suppose, too, but, but there's sort of like a deeper reality there that maybe is a little comparable to, to religion again, because every big city, you know, has a different church for a different faith group, the same way sports bars do. Am I, am I, am I getting that sort of analogy right, do you think? Yeah, and I don't know, you know, if it's every city, but certainly the big cities. Like I, I, I met a guy a few years back who was a part owner of a bar in the village in New York. 
that was sort of like the unofficial Philadelphia Eagles bar, fan bar. So if you were a Philly person displaced to New York, which there's lots of, on Sunday, you would go to this bar. And if you wore like a Philly's logo or something, you got a dollar off your beers and they would give out free cheesesteaks, you know? And, um, and it turns out that there's a bar like that for every team in New York and in, you know, some other cities. Um, and actually in New York, you know, even if you can go watch like, Australian and New Zealand sports in the middle of the night when there's not a pandemic at bars. But the idea, I mean, of the sports bar is so ubiquitous that it's normal to us. But, you know, I started to think about it. You know, sports is famously like a conversation starter and the other conversation starters are the weather or politics, but you don't have weather bars and you don't have politics bars and other entertainment. You don't have Harry Potter bars and, you know, you don't have the only a, a sort of equivalent of a sports bar would be live music. And in most places, that's still like pretty few and far between. You go to a jazz club and you have to go at night, um, you know, but sports bars are everywhere in the world and they're their own category. And it's kind of weird that they even exist. But, you know, you go in there and there's a lot of games on and, and I, I I've traveled for around the world a lot for 20 plus years. I spent a lot of time in airports and you can go sit at the bar. Any bar in any airport in the world is going to have some TV on with a sporting event over the bar. And you can look up at it and it could be cricket or snooker. And I could like look at the guy next to me or the woman next to me and you're like, I don't understand this. And they'll explain it to me or they'll want to talk about it. it it's a, a universal language that makes you a lot of friends really easily. Interesting. So you can explain the wicket to me then for how the cricket uh, pitcher thing works. <laughs> no, I always forget. <laughs> That's great. So I'm curious, Larry, about timing here of your book, because we just celebrated the one year anniversary or, you know, commemorated the one year anniversary of the start of this horrible pandemic. And it came, we will recall, just as Mar March Madness was set to begin. And of course, canceling March Madness like led to another form of March Madness that um, I'm not sure we recovered from, but there were other ways we coped. Uh, and it was really interesting kind of to see that. And you were, I assume, still working on the book or had you finished it by, by last year this time? I had pretty much finished it. You know, it was in, in sort of post-production, mm -hmm. you know, but my editor pretty quickly came back and said, you know, you need to go take a look at this whole pandemic thing. You know, so I went and back and talked to some of the psychologists that, you know, I had spoken to previously, especially about things like post-traumatic healing and um, the social effects. And then I also had the opportunity to look at some of the ratings when sports returned. And, you know, it was in a way the pandemic has been a, a living laboratory for a lot of the ideas in my book and good and bad things have come out of that. You know, one was it was really clear that sports were really missed when they weren't here. Um, I had a lot of people that I've interviewed over the last four years, you know, email me and say, oh, God, I've not watched as much sports ever as I have, you know, since they came back on TV. Um, but also, you know, so on the one hand, we learned, you know, it, it's a it's a coping mechanism and extraction from the problems around us, which it was, you know, after 9-11 and after a lot of natural disasters. But but the fact that to some degree your the, the positive impact of it, even when you're at home, relies on there being spectators in the stands, it works for a year. It works for a season. It works for a pandemic. It doesn't really work long, long term. If nobody went back to the games, the quality of our sports fandom experience would decline, uh, possibly substantially. Um, fortunately, you know, that's probably not going to happen at the same time when you can go to a stadium and sit shoulder to shoulder among 50,000 people and high five strangers and not worry about getting sick, that will mark the return of normalcy as, as it has many times before. And then there's, there's been some interesting lessons I think learned in the pandemic from sports. So immediately everybody was scrambling and the NBA and the NHL came back and said, we're gonna play in a bubble. Everyone's like, well, what's a bubble, right? We didn't use the word bubble, we didn't use the word pods. Right back then. So, you know, what we learned from that is, hey, if you stay and hang out only with the people in your group, small group that you know are safe and don't mix, it's going to be OK. And then you watch baseball and they played in these, you know, the entire regular season, totally empty stadiums, not one fan at any regular season baseball game. 
cardboard cutouts. But what we learned is, hey, not going out is what we have to do now to be safe. And look, baseball finished its season. And then football, you know, they levied huge fines on these coaches at the beginning for not showing up on TV, not wearing masks. So I feel while, you know, sports certainly, you know, they made some mistakes and they did some irresponsible things to get back on the air. They also, in a lot of ways, taught us lessons during a pandemic that were valuable or useful. And now the fans are returning. But I guess the biggest lesson of all is, and I wrote an op-ed about this for the New York Daily News, one of the things we love about sports that, again, makes it different from other kinds of entertainment is it's unscripted and unpredictable. And we don't know what's going to happen. Right. And like I said, I like Star Wars, but back in 1977, I knew I'd have to see eight more movies and wait 40 years to know the good guys are going to win. You, you know, or I watch CSI. I know they're going to catch the guy. You know, uh, most entertainment is like that. Sports is not like that, which is also why we tend to have to watch it in real time or in my case with a DVR very soon afterwards. So I don't know the outcome, but I can fast forward through the commercials. Sure. Um, and. It, it is. And, and that's why we love Cinderella stories. And I say like, no, but if we honestly believed that we were sure that Team USA had no chance to beat the Russians in Lake Placid, nobody would have watched the game. We love upsets. Uh, we love Cinderella stories. Nobody expected Georgetown Hoyas to win the Big East, right? This is the kind of thing that is even more special um, about sports. And, and so if we love the unpredictability of sports, we have to take with that the fact that for one year, there's no March Madness. The uh, Kentucky Derby gets moved. The Masters is played without people. These are all, the Olympics gets postponed a year. And, you know, if they, they are going to have the Olympics now, and I think there's a lot of good things about that, but if we missed the Olympics, life would go on. And that's, you know, that's the nature of sports. We, you know, we love the unpredictability, and we sometimes have to accept that it doesn't always work out the way we want. Sure, yeah, like life. Um, so Larry, I want to ask a question about fantasy, fantasy sports, which mm -hmm. um, have, have become, I think, even more popular in, in, the, in the pandemic, people living a little bit vicariously. Um, and, and um, you know, uh, full disclosure that I'm part of a, a fantasy uh, baseball group that's um, been meeting for decades now. Um, I joined them only about 10 or so years ago um, that I find uh, from that, I get even more out of the kind of for the mental balance benefit, I would say, and the social cohesion benefit than I would of just, you know, being a Red Sox fan uh, because of this shared experience. And the funny thing is that the teams aren't really even teams, you know, they're the inventions of a collection of players from different teams, but they're, they're, they're the muskrats, they're my team. <laughs> but I, I'm curious, did you do some research on the, uh, on, on fantasy sports as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have a, uh, a fairly lengthy chapter on fantasy sports in the book. And, and you're right, it has become really big. When the last data that I had, which is probably about two years old now when I wrote the book, was about close to 60 million uh, people in North America and US and Canada um, regularly participated in fantasy sports. And there's just under 200,000, uh, 200 million sports fans. So that's almost one out of every three. And to it to become really big, but even before the pandemic, all of these factors, sort of what you described, it, it's there's a really big social aspect to it. There's a lot of people who play in a league or team, a league that has some sort of affiliation. They're friends from college, they're coworkers from an old job, um, a, a, a local neighborhood group. You know, and a lot of people play in multiple ones, and this is a way that they keep in touch with people that they otherwise wouldn't talk to, and. In a lot of ways, it's it's so it's a social media platform like Facebook, but its own its own thing, and a big one, and so that was just amplified in the pandemic because people needed that contact. But what I find interesting also is that there's a lot of multi generality to it. So there's people who like co manage their team with their son or daughter. And to me, fantasy sports has sort of the potential to be this generation's, you know, Monopoly or Scrabble or Gin Rummy, something you do around the kitchen table as a family, mm -hmm. so, which, you know, I think is, is good for the bonding. And then finally, the other big aspect of fantasy sports, which you mentioned having to play from different teams, is it's already having a significant, a measurable impact in breaking down that us versus them 
I hate the Yankees because I'm a Red Sox fan thing, right? Because, you know, and I interviewed right. a really diehard Redskins fan who was also a diehard fantasy football player for a long time, an early adopter. And he told me, you know, it took me four or five years before I could draft anyone from the Cowboys. But, you know, you have to if you're going to win. And it has spurred a sort of less... A, a, a fan who is more interested in the game and the sport and le- maybe less interested in the outcome of their own team's games. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in my league, there's a sort of craziness that if you draft a Red Sox, you're going to jinx yourself and you'd never draft a Yankee. So <laughs> you're now ruling out, you know, those, the, those two teams. Um, you, you, you've spoken a lot about the kind of mental, psychological and social benefit, you know, of, of, of being a fan. And I think if we, if we just sat and watched games in stadiums and, and, you know, in our, in our living rooms, it's one thing, but I find, and I think, you know, you do, cause I, I've gone on bike rides with you before, um, that that spirit of you know Lance Armstrong or that you know desire to sink the three-point shot like what you saw on TV uh motivates us to actually maybe get off the couch and uh, you know do you is that a connection that you see in in being a, a fan is more likely that you're gonna actually participate in some kind of physical activity yourself yeah absolutely and that sort of the second component of the subtitle healthier um but this one is is a little muddy because There is no doubt that sports fans are more active than non-fans, but the question is why? Hmm. In some cases, it's it's like a chicken or an egg thing, because in a lot of cases, you were already, you played a sport, you played soccer growing up, or, you know, you you played Little League or, or high school football, and now you're a fan of it, but your fandom did not cause you to be more active. Your activity level maybe caused you to be a fan. So, you know, I wanted to see, because we obviously live in a society that has, you know, some public health issues with obesity and diabetes. And, and to me, you know, anything that gets people more active is good. And, and I wanted to see, is there a role for sports fandom in doing that? So what I went to look for was a case where clearly you went out and did something active because you watch sports on TV. And that's a causal effect is a little hard to find, but, mm-hmm. but it's there. And, uh, you know, I joke sort of tongue in cheek, use American Ninja Warrior as an example of this, but it's a sport that was created out of whole cloth like mm-hmm. 10 years ago, right? There was no such thing. Right. Uh, and it went on TV and it became popular. And now flash forward 10 years later, there's hundreds of ninja training gyms across the country where kids and adults go and work out that clearly would not have existed had this show not been on TV and did not exist before it was on TV. You know, and then that's a, a pretty small example, but that's a clear example to me of the, the, the couch and the flat screen turning somebody into, you know, an active fit person. But then, and this is called in the industry, the participation effect. It's where watching sports turns you from a a sedentary person into a participant. Lance Armstrong was a really big one. Uh, They call it the Lance effect in the cycling industry. He basically exposed an American public not interested in cycling to cycling. And all through his career, the sales of bikes exploded. Um, They, it continued even after he was disgraced. And it also led to the really widespread rollout of charity rides. These 25, 50, 7,500 mile rides where you raise money for cancer or something, you know, you and I have done a couple of these. Um, But before Lance Armstrong, there were a few, you know, there was probably the Pan Mass Challenge and a couple of the really old big ones. Now they're everywhere. And they in turn spawned like an industry in five and 10K fun runs for charity. And a lot of this to me is directly attributable to Lance Armstrong. And those are people who didn't ride bikes, who are now going to go ride 100 miles for charity. And it's, it's not just the, the one day, they have to train for that, whether it's going to spinning classes or riding, you know, so it creates a sort of industry in fitness. And uh, I know we're running low on time, but the last example would be the Olympics. Every time on the Olympics roll around, gym membership spike, and it's a different <laughs> It's a different kind of model because it's typically not, I wanna take up this new sport, it's I wanna become fitter because I've seen these displays of athleticism. And I'm never 
I love NFL football, but I never watch a game and say, man, I'm going to go buy a helmet and get hit, right? That's just not going to happen. You're not going to start playing tackle football because you watched an NFL game. But when you watch the Olympics and you see all these, you know, relatable people who are, you know, college students, they're not millionaires. They're not going to ever get on the Wheaties box, but they work really hard and they're in great shape. Well, that's a pretty good incentive to go to the gym and you've seen cycling, rowing, running, you can, you know, do the machine for that. Exactly. Right. Right. So I'm curious, Larry, in, and I, by the way, if there are other questions, uh, send them in. I've got plenty that I, I want to kind of follow up with you on, but send them through if you would, please, on the, uh, in the Q and A. Uh, I see some uh, been coming in through the chat that I've been asking you, Larry. Um, you know, one I have, Larry, is just about the, the kind of um, experience of writing this book. And, um, you know, I'm an English teacher, former English teacher. <laughs> so, uh, so one question I have is the, the research that you did for this. Do you remember about how many people you talked to in writing this book, preparing it? Uh, no, a lot. I mean, because it falls into different categories, mm -hmm. right? So for the mental health stuff, I talked to a lot of sports psychologists um, and uh, who specifically study fans and fandom and not just sports fans, but other kinds of fandom. And then some more niche people who specialized in, in trauma. But I talked to regular doctors for some of the health, health stuff. And then... Um, a lot of, uh, historians for, for uh, like the civil rights part of it, the impact of Jackie Robinson, things like that. And that's all just sort of the experts, then fans, tons and tons and tons of fans, personal stories, and then people in the industry, sports team executives. Uh, and there's a lot actually that didn't fit in the book. I had I had a chapter on the impact of sports and revitalizing urban downtowns. Some specific examples like Denver and Indianapolis where really the city was rebuilt through relocating sports. And I went out to Denver and I interviewed Governor Hickenlooper and the mayor of Denver. And I went to India and I interviewed the governor of Indianapolis and the mayor, of, and that was, they were all, it was all great stuff. None of which is in the book because um, it just sort of at the end didn't fit with everything. Right. But, but that, and I had a chapter on romance. I, 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 my cat, it's impossible to clearly come up with this number because nobody tracks it. But by my guesstimate is there's about 200,000 people walking around the U S today who are engaged at sporting events. <laughs> you know, that, Will you marry me on the jumbotron? And I track down a lot of them and I talked to them and I got their stories and I heard about them hiring mascots to come to their wedding, to lead the first dance. And it's great, great stuff. But at the end, you know, it didn't prove anything except that people are romantic. So it's not in there. But, um, you know, so I talked to a lot of people who, who ended up on the cutting room floor, but they were, but it was great. That's, that's, yeah. And that's brave of you as a writer, too. I have to think that you must have um, had to cut some of your favorite observations and passages um, in the, in the, in the writing process, right? I did. And it, it's a little bit tough, but then it also leaves something for the future. And yeah. I've also been writing a lot of op-eds related to the book for different newspapers and it's a way to use material without giving away stuff that's in the book interesting right right and so like in a summary fashion how does writing a book and you've done three now differ from the thousands of articles uh, i know that you that you have written in your in your in your lifetime obviously the length is different kind of process wise and mentally talk about the difference if you would a little bit between the article and, and a book well about the worst thing your editor can say about your book is it sounds like a, it reads like a long magazine article <laughs> <laughs> um you know in, in in most magazine articles you don't really have the chance to you know sort of prove something you might you know you can say you know the data shows that and just state it as a as a sort of an outcome and move ahead but you can't do that in a book because people are going to be like, that's BS. That doesn't make any sense. You know, so you have to provide some backup, which I provide a lot of backup. And then there's a fine line where my editor says, you know, I think these 10 studies you cite supporting this one thing are enough, even though you have 50. Nobody cares about like the 11th one. So, you know, I, I cut a lot in that in that respect. But um but it's uh it's the structure. And that's, you know, when I taught at Dartmouth, that was my 
entire class was narrative structure for nonfiction. How do you set it up? What do you open with? What's the sequence? Do you go back and forth in time? So I played with this a lot. I mean, this was sort of like the third iteration of the structure that made it into the book. Impressive, you know, from an English teacher to, <laughs> to a writer to, to, that you're that fearless with your writing. Hey, I have a question, Larry, you know, and, I, and I, I probably should have brought this up sooner, but it seems to me the image we have of a, of a, of a sports fan, and, you know, that's again, I think a stereotype, is that it's uh, a male, a guy. But I know that's not true because I've read that part of your book about the um, number of female uh, fans and women that cheer on their teams. Do, do you have some observations on women as sports fans out there? Yeah, and it's it's not that you know women's or men's sports. I mean, there's certain like more women watch women's soccer at a higher rate, but you know, for between 47 and 48 percent of sports fans or people who identify themselves as sports fans in America are women. It's okay. almost half and half. And, you know, you, if you go, certainly if you went to one of these games in Indianapolis, if you went to the Georgetown, Colorado game on Saturday, there's going to be plenty of women in the stands. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about it. If you go to a sports bar on game day, there's plenty of women in there. And um, a lot of people, uh, I'm guessing you and your wife have watched a few football games together on the couch, right? It's that yeah. myth of a, of a football widow is, is just that. It's a myth. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, one of our uh, viewers says, uh, many men are surprised and a little uncomfortable that I can hold my own in a conversation on baseball. And my wife- I am not that. surprised. I'm, I'm proud. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, and then uh, talk about, if you would, just about the a kind of um, social benefit factor. And this is a question that came through on um, having- the, I mean, it's the investment of a city or a town in bringing sports to their town and, you know, thinking of how much money teams, uh, towns have to raise or cities have to raise in taxes to have the, the stadium um, in their, you know, in their, in their city. And there's an argument, it seems to me, maybe from your book to make in favor of spending lots of money if you're a city that cares about its people. There is, but it's a very narrow argument. That's one of the reasons I ended up not putting this chapter in because I believe that in the cases of Indianapolis and Denver, it was a good bet. It was a good investment. Mm -hmm. Most stadium, publicly funded stadiums are not good. It's, it, there's a, an entire uh, cadre of economists who study just this and, it, and economists would laugh if you floated the idea that like public financing of stadiums was a good idea and even when i talked to some of the leading ones they say yeah yeah indy and denver those are the exceptions that's like the low-hanging fruit but you know something like uh the dallas cowboy stadium you can't justify and you know as i mentioned with the license plate though you know like sports have a weird crossover into public policy that other for-profit businesses don't though there's plenty of tax breaks for building your new, you know, uh, your Elon Musk, your new battery factory in Reno or whatever. But, right, but, right. Um, but yeah, I, I can't, I can't say like this, ha having the sports teams get their stadiums paid for by somebody else, the taxpayer is a good thing. That's necessarily a good idea. Yeah. Hey, I want to, I want to mention something else too. Uh, and, the, and the question we touched on it briefly earlier about some of the social um, kind of impact of um, athletes of color. And I know, um, you know, obviously the Jackie Robinson uh, impact on not just on sports and on baseball, on sports, on, on, on culture. Um, and, um, and Hank Aaron, um, you know, uh, who passed away recently, uh, for some people that was the first time that they were really all celebrating. And, and Jackie Robinson, if you were alive then, that may be the first time that you were actually celebrating um, a black man as a as a white fan as a white person and I've, I this is something I read recently and most recently and this is a nice question that's come through about Kobe Bryant and the outpouring of grief and support from fans and non fans alike. Um, I don't think this is necessarily a race question but it says something about our culture that this this is this iconic figure um, brought so many people um, out to uh, pay their respects and support. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's been a continuum. You know, one of the historians I spoke to who specialized in Jackie Robinson said, it, you know, it seems ridiculous in retrospect that we even had to have a first black player, you know, that it was such a big deal that it, that you, you know, that it should, it should have probably happened earlier. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you also got to remember that at the time, 
baseball was by far the biggest sport, bigger than football is now. I mean, Jackie Robinson played on the biggest national stage we had in America. There was nothing bigger than baseball. And, but still, you know, even Hank Aaron, Hank Aaron got death threats, you know, uh, and, and I think this is over, overall positive. I'm not trying to paint a dreary picture, but it's been baby steps. Yeah. And it's, it's a progression that, that has taken, you know, decades to, to evolve. But the big difference or a big differentiator is the advent of social media. And that's really changing things because, you know, the, the activist athlete that uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith at the Mexico City Olympic Games, they had yeah. to rely on their message being filtered through a media that didn't really like them. Now the athletes can just reach out and met, give their message in their words, if you're LeBron James, to you know, however many you know, tens of millions of Twitter followers. And, and um, that has in turn made the individual athletes a little bit into more celebrity figures. Matter of fact, there's a, a concern in the sports industry that the younger people are more interested in following athletes than the teams. That may be a problem for team owners, but it's not a problem for uh, players who want to take social and political stands. Yeah, for sure. Well, Larry, I know we're just about out of time, and I want to say again, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and encourage everybody who doesn't have a copy to get themselves a copy. It's a great book, Larry. I'm not just saying that because you're my my buddy. Um, and thanks again for tonight, everybody. And uh, and Larry, go Hoyas. What do you say? Yeah, Saturday. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to both of you for this wonderful conversation tonight. And thank you to our viewers at home. Fans, How Watching Sports Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Understanding by Larry Olmsted is available from Gibson's Bookstore. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>